Hey guys, what's up? It's FalsePulse123 and welcome back to my channel. Now, I've been a bit of a reading slump lately. And I can't really say if it's one thing or the other. I just haven't really been getting on top of reading as much as I have been. So, this is really a wrap-up of the last three months. And I've only read six books. But before we get into it, I want to talk about three things. First, if you haven't seen my Twitch streams, don't watch them, they're trash. But let me introduce you to my beautiful baby boy, Nocino. What the heck is that, Ryan? Nocino is an English walnut liqueur that is made in Italy, except it is now being made here on my fucking bookshelf. Love to see it. There's my deodorant going places. Whenever I have writer's block, especially with like, you know, a video or a blog article, I like to switch the format, try something a little different, and usually that helps me sort of get from my block. So this video we're going to be doing like a little rapid fire mini book reviews, and then we're going to get into the more salient themes that I mentioned in the title. And lastly, I'm going to be cutting my TBR down to one book instead of the four, and we'll be getting to that at the end of the video. Now that we've gotten that out of the way, don't forget to like, comment, subscribe, sacrifice your firstborn to the dark ones, you know, all that stuff. And let's get into the video. Ramajan Yellow Yellowhammer follows Warren St. John from the New York Times as he follows around the Alabama Crimson Tide during a season while exploring the creation of fandom. In a way that pokes giant holes in my own thesis research paper, might I add? And to a lesser extent, the nature of tribalism. Even if St. John didn't directly state it in the book that he was a journalist, you can definitely tell from the writing style, the word choice, and the cadence that it is journalistic. It uses words like zeitgeist and other journaly words that you don't really hear outside of that type of audience. And so it was definitely more unique in the terms of memoirs that I read. However, when we're talking about writing, there's also some examples of r slash men writing women. Profitable crowd consists mainly of well-fed, middle-aged males. But for the college game in the South, there's an abundance of youth and women. And many of them in sun dresses that could easily be confused with lingerie. The young woman next to me is probably 20, 21, lithe and tall, with collarbones like wire hangers, perfectly pedicured toes the size of jelly beans, and a feathery bob of brown hair that rustles seductively against the back of her neck when she stands to cheer. A red silk sundress seems to have floated down over her frame the way a parachute might fall atop a small tree. She seems altogether too prim and refined to chat with a stranger at a football game. When the law of an early crimson tide first down, I decided to give it a try. Overall, as memoirs go, I thought it had some interesting moments and illustrated a part of sports culture that I was unfamiliar with. It also, to some small extent, explored this idea of tribalism. How even in our postmodern society, even when we try to eschew strict binaries, there are still ways that us versus them mentality still creeps in. That we tend to overlook the good in our enemies and the bad in our allies. Either that or this was a book about a guy, like, you know, watching football. Okay, next up is The Oxbow Incident by Walter Van Tilburg Clark. It's a bit of a name. So, real talk. The first two books in this list took me a literal month to read just by themselves because they were that dull and that boring and this is why I don't usually do TBRs. But actually, like, what's the book about? The Oxford Incident is literally the story of a lynch mob getting together in the Wild West and putting some people to death for cattle wrestling. Story-wise, it's pretty cut and dried. But I feel the main bulk of this book and what makes it interesting as a piece of literature is its discussions and its themes. I'm going to be getting into that later on in this video, so please stay tuned if that interests you. But if we're talking about the book outside of, I guess, its analysis, I found that it had slow pacing. There was very long, drawn-out conversations that just really didn't go anywhere. And there was also a lot of casual racial slurs that just were not the vibe sets. So, 
I do like westerns. I do want to state that because I feel that westerns are kind of like a not very popular genre these days. But I do not think this one aged very well in terms of both writing, story content, and just general, I guess, vibes. So, unless you're a big western fan and you want to read something that's sort of like quintessential to the genre, it's skippable. Next. So, I needed something a little lighter than literal lynching. Give me a point for that alliteration, Ryan. And so I read The Cat Who Had 14 Tales by Lillian Jackson Brun. If I get this one out before my book haul video, then you probably won't know how much I love her. But she's a really popular artist who I have a lot of their bo her books. The Cat Who Had 14 Tales is a short story collection of Braun's previous written works that were published before she wrote the Cat Who series in, I believe, the 60s? Yes, I didn't think about that. The um, first couple books were written in the 60s, and she went on hiatus, and then she came back with, I believe it was the Cat Who Saw Red, which happened in the 80s, 20 years later. Maybe I'm wrong about that. Please correct me in the comments, all you Lillian Jackson Brun fans. But let's keep going. Honestly, it was a light, fun time. There was some cats, there was some humor, there was some spoopy moiters and some spoopy ghosts. And it was a vibe, you know? I like cats, I like when an author shows me their range, and I just like how there's different ways that authors tell stories. So, it's always nice to see a peek behind the curtain. So, next up is my obligatory graphic novel of the month, because... I always manage to somehow just randomly read a graphic novel in one setting in like the myth, even though I feel like I never have enough time to read. But that was Sheets by Brennan Thumbler, which is a name that came out of my mouth hole. So Sheets is this middle grade coming of age novel. Uh, gave me a little bit of, oh, what was that book I read last year? Don't remember it, maybe Editing Ryan does. Overall, I found this graphic novel to be really wholesome, just kind of the vibes I was looking for, but it was also a little run of the mill. It was pretty standard for the sort of middle grade coming of age graphic novels that I've read. I think it was good. I liked how it touched on things like grief and depression, because I really don't think we talk about depression enough, especially in children's literature. And the art style was just really, really beautiful. Um, you'd probably like it. I recommend it. There's a sequel to it, so I might have to check it out. There we go. Next up is King Solomon's Minds by H. Ryder Haggard. King Solomon's Mind is the progenitor of what we call the Lost World genre. A 19th century adventuring genre about exploring the savage jungles of the dark continent of the other colonies. This genre influenced such media as the Tarzan movies, Congo by Michelle Crenton, the cannibal boom in 1980s Italian cinema, as well as that other, other movie DreamWorks made in the 2000s, and feminist masterpiece Cannibal Women in the Avocado Jungle of Doom. Hmm. You know, when you think about it, maybe the real treasure is the homoerotic tension you found along the way. <laughs> Real talk. This story follows Ellen Quantumain, an elephant hunter and casual colonialist who leads some white people to sell some diamonds. Wait, wait, let me check. Oh, I'm sorry. Apparently they were going to go find Sir Henry's long lost brother that we totally don't forget about for the vast majority of the book. In all honesty, this book was surprisingly less racist than expected. At least compared to shit like, I don't know, Mary Poppins and the Golden Compass. That just did not age well. I'm sorry, people. I do want to say that there are some colonistic aspects of the book, and that me, as a reader, am going to view the actions of the characters differently from the readings, readers of Victorian England in 1885. H.R. Haggard lived in what is now South Africa before beginning his writing career, and it's pretty obvious from the writing that he based a lot of the culture of the Hakanis, from the African 
nations that he interacted with during his time there. I don't think this book is calling us propaganda or anything, but I re can really only say that it's pretty neutral on the subject. You can make the argument that Quantum Man is an unreliable narrator and that his colonial mindset is supposed to be foiled by the ways that Sir Henry Cole. Sir Henry Curtis and Captain Good embrace the Kakani culture. You can say that the whole gang of white boys are thieving colonists and white saviors, and as a white boy living in America in the 21st century, my opinion doesn't really mean shit. We're all going to get different readings out of it, and we're all going to be coming at this from a really different viewpoint, especially based off of our backgrounds. However, if you do want to read this book and you want a more stronger grasp of colonialism in novels, I would recommend two books. Things Fall Apart by Chinoy Achibi, which is set in an Igbo village in Nigeria, and Boxes and Saints by Jin Lu Yang, which are two companion graphic novels that deal with religion and colonialism during the Boxer Rebellion. They're both really fantastic books, and also two books that I drew a lot of comparisons to when I was reading King Solomon's Minds, especially Things Fall Apart, which is fantastic. Overall, what I liked about King Solomon's Minds a lot better than the other books I read this month was simply because it was a good read. It had iconic scenes, it had interesting characters, it had all these really great action moments, and the writing didn't taste like a stale biscuit, which some books I can't say the same thing about. That's right, Clark, I'm fucking coming for your fucking bag. Fight me. So, let's get into the last book that I read this month, and then we're going to get into the salient themes, which is a phrase that came out of my mouth. And the last book I read was The Maltese Falcon by Dashiell Hammett. Let's crack up in another genre. Hard-boiled fiction is a type of crime fiction popularized in the 20s and 30s, which features tough guy detectives trying to solve cases in a corrupt city. There's a lot of depression era sentiment going around, and this is a genre like westerns where it's hard to separate the tropes from its historical background. Also, side note, because I'm a nerd and I'm better than you, Hardboil is different from noir. Noir features essentially anti-villains, people who do bad things but morality is questionable. Hardboil features anti-heroes, people who are technically on the side of the law but face the corruption of law enforcement and other entities. This is confused a lot, especially since hardware stories are adapted to film noir, which is separate from the literary genre of crime noir. Or something like that. I literally just wiki walked this five minutes ago. Point being, if you haven't seen the 1941 version with, hum with Humphrey Bogart, the Maltese Falcon features local asshole detective Sam Spade as he falls deep into a mystery surrounding the Maltese Falcon. A fun, shiny MacGuffin that is worth buku bucks. Unlike the 1941 movie, however, it isn't heavily censored and straight-washed. This story flows really well for being written in the late 1920s, and it ages pretty well. I liked how Bridget played this sort of ingenue character instead of the more stereotypical femme fatale, and it gave her this kind of death without demonizing her for her sexuality. Well, in my opinion. I also really like the inclusion of Joel Cairo, which I'm about to go off on a tangent, so skip to this timestamp if you don't want to hear about the gays in the 1930s. But why would you not want to listen to that? Joe Cairo is one of the people looking for the bird. He's a gay person of color. Let's break that down, because it's actually kind of interesting. The book describes Cairo as Levantine, or Levantine, I'm not sure how it's pronounced, which in historical context essentially means Eastern Mediterranean. It's a little vague. It's like calling somebody Persian or Scandinavian. It covers a lot of ground. You get the impression that he has an olive complexion, but the exact details are iffy. Also, Cairo is explicitly said to be gay. Now, side note, because I don't want people in the comments saying that I'm a trash human being. I want to mention that while bisexuality was first used in this modern context in the late 19th century, it wouldn't be until the 1940s when Alfred Kinsey sort of popularized the term through his research. It's also not until the 1970s that queer men and women started using the label bisexual as a common catch-all term for multisexual sexualities. I say this because I don't want anyone accusing me of erasing or assuming Kyra's identity, but I also think it's important to explore the way that LGBT language has evolved along with our understandings of sex and gender. Point being, this is 1928 when this book was written. Cairo is labeled as queer, which, given the historical context, would have been a gay man. And also, I think there's something profound about how explicit it is. 
There's no subtext, there's no queer coding. The guy walks in and the secretary is like, hey yo, there's a big old gay in your office and he wants to see you. And that's just part of his character and personality. It has literally no bearing on the plot, never comes up, you know. Hammond just woke up one morning and he was like, aha, I know it. A woman, a gay, and a fat man with a twink bodyguard are going to steal a fucking statue. And that's just what happened in a book in the 1920s. I also think it's really interesting how hard-boiled stories didn't shy away from including queer people in... I also think it's really interesting how in a lot of these hardball detective stories, um, The Big Sleep also comes to mind, is that writers didn't shy away from including queer characters in their stories. But also, kind of look at the time. Cary Grant was long-term roommates with Randall Scott. Stories like Mylene Dietrich and Josephine Baker were well-known bisexuals, and the art world was just chock full of gays, including Paul Cadmus, George Tucker, Frida Kahlo, Joe O'Keefe, J.C. Leyendecker, and George Platt Lines whose homoerotic works permeated both print and gallery. Needless to say that before the Hays Code and the pseudomoralism that came with it, gay people were pretty out there in the open. I say all this because we tend to get the impression that all historical fiction is offensive, whitewashed, and problematic, and okay, granted, a lot of it is. A lot of the representation isn't perfect. But it's also re important to recognize that there's also a form of erasure. Queer people have always existed, and queer people exist even in old books. Second, it's just a lot of times when these stories get told, like the well-known 1941 film, they are erased by a society that doesn't care about their existence. So, if you skipped ahead, here's what up. Gays exist, the book was pretty solid, and I need to read more hard-boiled fiction because it's good. Now let's get into the next segment, False Boozy and his Hopefully I learn how to put graphics on the screen. The social contract is a theory in philosophy that's basically like... <laughs> so, basically here's what up. Morality's fake, we're all selfish, horrible, awful people, and the only reason why we don't just rape and pillage each other is because a bunch of our ancestors got together and we should work together, and if anybody steps out of line, we live in a society and we're going to punish you. So, tradition, and religion, and empathy, and all that bullshit is just a bunch of social- It's just a bunch of social constructs we built on top of that to keep it compliant, and honestly, it's not a vibe. It's kinda sad. Just not a good mood. When it comes to thinking about, like, you know, the humans, but- it is an interesting way of looking at the world and government systems. It is a very political idea in its essence. Tribalism is essentially a step up from the social contract. You still have a self-interested morality, but there's people in your corner, whether it's family, a nation, or merry chat shippers. Tribalism also has this protective aspect to it, where you need to defend your kin from barbarian outsiders who want to steal your women and then jauntily square dance in front of your barn ring. Hello <laughs> Hammer's discussion of tribalism is fairly one note. It's mostly just musing on why as a society we organize ourselves on fairly arbitrary lines. Like how, for instance, Ladrian shippers are stupid fucking idiots and need to understand basic character development and how I am obviously intellectually and morally superior because I ship Sabrina x Chloe and it is OTP. Or like, Roll Tide or something? I don't know. In the Oxbow incident, we actually get some more meat to the bones. The town in Oxbow is the tribe, and there's clear stakes on how the rustlers pose a threat to their livelihood and safety of the community. The main issue is not the community seeks justice, but how it does. This book is pretty explicit about the events. A group of people are fed misinformation, and through a process of emotional pandering, fear, and toxic masculinity, they eventually follow a demagogue to murder three men who it ultimately turns out to be innocent. 
What the men wanted wasn't necessarily the type of restitutive justice the monarch would give in its slow and ineffective way. What they wanted was revenge, and they used a scapegoat to get that. I want to quote the author here when he discussed why he wrote the book. It was certainly obvious, the whole substance and surface of the story, that it was a kind of American Nazism that I was talking about. I had the parallel in mind, all right, but what I was most afraid of was not the German Nazis, or even the Bund, but the ever-present element in any society which can always be led to act the same way, to use authoritarian methods to oppose authoritarian methods. What I wanted to say was, it can happen here, it has happened here, in minor but sufficient indicative ways, a great many times. Hey guys, guess how many books I read that had the n-word in it this month? Love that, but you know, just freaking love that shit. But before we get into the actual depth of the conversation, let's discuss the context that these words were used in. In Rammer Jammer Yellow Hammer, the N-word is deliberately quoting a racist football fan, and Warren St. John uses it as a springboard to discuss both Alabama's troubled history with race and the way it relates to its antebellum period, as well as thoughts on how we superficially organize ourselves into self-proclaimed tribes, even when the things we have in common are very superficial, and that they sometimes allow us to ignore problematic and troubling elements about the people we associate with. In King Solomon's mind, the term is used exactly once. Specifically to mention that he would not use it to describe the black people in the story. Specifically because Haggard recognized the dehumanizing aspects of the ward. I do want to acknowledge that Haggard does use other terms which were, are now considered slurs, but they would have been a lot more neutrally used at the time period. In the Oxbow incident, it's used to describe the token f black guy. Fun! To quote a conversation with a friend I had about this book, Am I just expecting too much from old white men? My own, my own expectations and sensitivities are obviously a product of the modern day. Because let's be honest, in the 1940s there were still plenty of people around that used that word and said it to people's faces. By contemporary standards, it was about as racist as writing a book with Fu Manchu. Nowadays, we have hang-ups about that type of thing, historically accurate without trying to be harmful, but back then, people would have cared, so I really can't judge Tilbert like he's a modern author. I can, however, judge the way that we, as a modern audience, interact with the world. There's a lot of criticism over books like Huckleberry Finn and To Kill a Mockingbird being taught in schools for this reason. Some proponents break out the historical accuracy toward which I've always found to be a very vague argument at best of times, or to say something about how it illustrates the prejudice of the time. But I feel that both of these arguments don't recognize the slurs or a deeply emotional response. It doesn't matter if there's a neutral context that the term is being used in, it's that people you trust are using a word that's designed to hurt you, and then dismissing the pain and fear you feel from it. I think a lot of people should sit down and think about how lucky they are that there isn't a word out there. That if it was screamed at you from a passing car or shouted at you from across the street, that you wouldn't immediately fear for your health and well-being. And then they should think, why isn't there a word like that for me? Well, guys, that was the end of our discussion on salient themes. So let's do some fun stuff before I end this video. First, let's shake my new Sino. Because it needs to be shaken every day. Gotta burp the baby. And we're going to decant that in about two weeks. Love to see it. The second is we are going to finally choose a beautiful, lovely book from my egg basket. So I'm just going to close my eyes because I don't feel like blindfolding myself today. Oh, okay. And I guess I got this one. <laughs> Hopefully that looked good on camera. Okay, let's see what we got. <gasps> it's a piece of paper. And we're going to be reading Jack of Hearts and Other Parts by L.C. Rosen. So, this is going to be up next on my next monthly TBR. So guys, thanks for watching all the way to the end of my videos. I know they tend to be a little bit longer, and I'm trying to cut down my scripts. This one was seven pages, so obviously I failed. <laughs> but, you know, you can do a lot of things to help me out if you do enjoy watching my content. Like it if the video is good. 
comment because that's always a really great thing and I want to have discussions about the books I read. That's why I make these videos. And of course, if you've seen a few of my videos and you're liking what I'm doing with my content, please feel free to subscribe. Anyway guys, I think that's it. So remember, wash your hands, tell your loved ones you love them, and live every single day trying to be a better and better person. Spell spells one, two, three, and you guess it, I'm signing out. There we go. What are you just gonna do with that? First book up is Rammer Jammer Yellow Hammer by Warren St. John. Rammer Jammer Yellow Hammer follows St. Warren Jan St. Warren St. John. Next up is something a little bit older than 20, when did the book come out? It's like 2013? Well, who the fuck cares because I'm getting into the good bits. I'm getting into the good bits, bitch. <laughs> Okay. A fun, shiny MacGuffin that is warm. <laughs> Fuck me. A fine, a fine, shiny MacGuffin. <laughs>